this week's episode, Clive Cookson, science editor from the Financial Times, introduces author and evolutionary developmental biologist Sean B. Carroll. In his talk, Sean looks at the rules that regulate life across all scales and how they've been used to restore national parks across the world, like Yellowstone, the Serengeti and Mozambique's Gorongosa. Well, it gives me huge, huge pleasure to introduce and moderate um, Sean Carroll. The number of writer scientists who excel both in their research and in their writing, I think can be um, counted on the fingers of two hands. Um, you can think of some of them. And by an extraordinary coincidence, two of them are called Sean Carroll. <laughs> We've got one of the Sean Carrolls here tonight. I used to think they were the same person about 10 years ago when they both got going. I thought, gosh, we really do have a new Leonardo of the scientific <laughs> world here who can write and research everything from black holes and cosmology through to evolutionary biology. Now, um, they, they distinguish themselves by their middle initial. Sean B. Carroll has made a name for himself as one of the most original thinkers about evolutionary development, Evo Devo, how evolution works at the very earliest stages, the embryonic development, and how that plays out um, in later life and in um, nature. He's produced several excellent books um, I'm just going to read a line that I wrote in 2009 when I was rounding up eight books that came out then for the Darwin centenary, both of 150th, um, both of his birth, I think it was bicentenary, and 150 years of Origin of Species. And I said they were all great books. They, the books published to mark Darwin's anniversaries this year stand out for their quality as well as their quantity. Best is Sean Carroll's Remarkable Creatures, which manages to combine a wide narrative sweep with wonderful details and superb writing. That is true, too, of his latest book, The Serengeti Rules, which he'll be talking about. He won't just be talking about that, but that will be the anchor for his talk. And you can buy this wonderful book, also reviewed by me in the FT afterwards. <laughs> I think I've probably gone on long enough, so Sean, please. <laughs> Thanks, Clive. Thanks, Clive, for that very generous introduction. For all those kind remarks over the past, uh, my children thank you, too. Um, wow, if, uh, if I could just sort of summon the ghosts of the people who've stood here uh, it's a spine-tingling place for a scientist, especially a scientist with a keen interest in history. So thanks to the Royal Institution for having me. And thanks to all of you folks for coming out on a Wednesday night. So um, I am going to talk about the Serengeti rules. We're going to get out on the Serengeti in a couple of minutes, but I want to give you some context. Um, it was the summer of 2014. I had just finished work on a film for the Smithsonian Channel in the U.S. on mass extinction. And in addition to getting to know some of the geologists that had studied major events in the past, I got to know several ecologists and went around parts of the world with them. And I began to appreciate that even some highly protected places, like say Yellowstone National Park in the United States, were starting to show some issues. And if I, thought, I was, began to worry if some of the most protected places were having problems, what was that going to say about the rest of the world? And like you, I, I saw headlines like this one, um, talking about what had happened to the world's wildlife over the last 40 to 50 years. Um, and other headlines about, for example, paving a highway right through the middle of the Serengeti, um, the World Heritage Site in Tanzania. And I thought, well, two things. I'd never been to the Serengeti, despite a lifelong dream of going there. So I thought it was probably better be time to go. And I thought if I was going to go, I should take my family. So I did. Six of us shared a vehicle for a couple of weeks. And when I went, I really went with a combination of excitement that I was going to go to a place that I had always dreamt, dreamt of going, but a little bit of anxiety from those headlines. What would I find when I got there? And as we drove in, I started getting a little bit worried because we're looking left and we're looking around, we're looking 
on the horizon. We see a lioness. But, you know, all we can see is the, you know, her back against that grass. And I'm thinking, you know, we're, we're in trouble here. I'm the only biologist in my clan, and they're not going to want to do this for days on end if that's what we're going to see of wildlife. But we drove further in, and we started to see little streaks of green and a few acacia trees and came up over a bend. We wound up being just surrounded by zebra, a couple thousand stripes in all directions, a couple thousand zebra. There was a water hole there that they had come down to swim in and, and uh, to, to drink from. And then on the horizon, a troop of elephants coming down to that same water hole. And so we, here we were, just this magnificent 360-degree view. And from that moment on, I had no worries about the Serengeti because it offered up an unending canvas of animals of all sizes and shapes and colors from sturdy warthogs to uh, lounging hippos, which they're particularly good at, um, sleek impala, majestic giraffes. I, I, my wife and I were so enchanted with giraffes, I made the, them stop the vehicle every time we came upon a giraffe, which was probably a couple hundred stops over, over a week. Um, never got tired of looking at them. So um, it, it, it was more than I expected. I thought I had really been prepared from everything I had read or TV shows I had seen, but it, was, it really topped my expectations. And as I sort of gazed out over this landscape and all this wildlife over the first few days, um, a, a bit of an unsettling thought occurred to me, um, which, which was, you know, I was awestruck, but I didn't understand what I was looking at. I'm a professional biologist. I didn't understand why or how the Serengeti was the way it was. And that's you know, a bit embarrassing for me because I've actually spent my entire career, as Clive mentioned, studying animals and actually studying how they form, even studying how they get stripes and spots. But I've been doing that mostly through a microscope and seeing sort of the invisible things that happen inside animals that build their bodies and build their body parts and build different kinds of, of animals, um, mostly small creatures like butterflies and things like that. So what really had me stumped were the numbers of animals. I've been fortunate to be in really nice, interesting places in the world on many continents, but I was just floored by the number of animals that I was looking at on the Serengeti. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't know why there would be different numbers of animals whatsoever. But I did, because I've studied biology a long time. I know a few things about what at least goes on inside animal bodies. And one thing I did know is that, you know, there, inside animal bodies, there's lots of reactions going on, lots of processes going on. So I began to think about, well, what do we know about the internal world of animals, and what can we, could that possibly explain what we know about so the external world of animals? So I didn't know why there were so many wildebeest on the Serengeti. I didn't know why there were so few topi that are virtually about the same size. But what I did know was that all the substances in animal bodies and in our bodies are regulated. The amount of everything, fats like cholesterol, salts like calcium, hormones like estrogen, enzymes that digest our food, all maintained in particular ranges and in different ranges over many, many, many different orders of magnitude. And that generally even the number of cells in our body are maintained. Red cells, white cells, kidney cells, gut cells, etc. They're maintained in a particular range. And that one of the major quests of biology over the last 50, 60 years, particularly the tribe I belong to, so-called molecular biologists, has been to look at these processes and understand what I'll call the rules of regulation. To really understand how life works, how we are the way we are, we need to understand the rules that, for example, regulate our bodies. Now, how have scientists been doing this? So we've generally been doing it by trying to find, to use some sports terms, sort of the key players in any particular process. In this case, molecules that regulate a process. And once we have identified those key players, we sort of see how do they play with other things? How do they play with other molecules, for example, and figure out those rules that govern their play. And that knowledge has been tremendous power because by understanding precisely what regulates processes in our human body, that has guided all sorts of advances in medicine. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say a revolution in medicine. Because that knowledge allows us, 
when these things fall out of whack, when regulation is somehow awry, and really most diseases that I can think of or that you can think of are really problems with regulation, where too much or too little of something is being produced. But the produced. central question that I want to focus on in my talk tonight is about life on a larger scale. Not about the number of molecules or cells, but really the number of animal bodies. And the question I want to ask is how are the numbers of animals and plants regulated out there in nature? I want to even ask the question, are there rules that govern life at larger scales? Well, as it turns out, if there weren't, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have a book, and you'd have the night off, okay? So to start this adventure, I want to give you a little history of the Serengeti that I thought you might enjoy. Um, to put it in perspective, the Serengeti uh, was, it went through various stages in the development as a national park, but it really, what, tourism was not a big deal um, through the first half of the 20th century. And some of the first people to go into the Serengeti and really take a serious look around were biologists. And one of the first things they wanted to do and confronted, you can imagine, with all that wildlife, you know, scientists count things, right? How many things are here? So what did they do? Well, I'm going to show you clips from um, a film about the first uh, aerial survey of wildlife in the Serengeti. So you can see how this was done in 1958 by two German zoologists, uh, Bernard and Michael Jimmick. And this is a, a clip that's going to show a little bit of their methodology. So here's, there's Bernard on the left and his son Michael on the right, and they're plotting their course in their fancy airplane. <laughs> Pretty cool looking plane. And uh, they and two other spotters are going to climb into this plane, generally with the doors open, so they have a nice clear view and take off and fly low and slow over the Serengeti. Okay, so what's that look like? Let's go counting with the Jimmix. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's exactly what they're doing. At about 120 miles an hour, they're counting all the wildebeest in this picture. Okay, and as you can see, the wildebeest are not standing still. So they did this day after day, uh, in this grid pattern, but they're not just counting wildebeest, they're counting all the large mammals they can see and count by eye from, from whatever altitude that they feel safe to fly at, which is pretty low. So what did they come up with? So this is the results of their survey, January 1958. They came up with 99,481 <laughs> wildebeest, okay? Not 482, not 480. 57,199 zebra, okay? And with further sort of Teutonic precision, uh, 5,000 or so topi, 1,800 buffalo, just 60 elephants. So elephants were pretty scarce in those days. Still sort of a leftover, a hangover effect of the ivory trade in earlier decades. But in total, 366,000 large mammals. Now they admitted, they said, they might have missed, oh, maybe 10,000 out of the edges. But they thought this was a pretty accurate survey. They tried really hard to get the numbers right. They wrote a book of the same name as their movie, Serengeti Shall Not Die, and they wondered aloud, you know, were there enough plains and mountains and river valleys and bush areas to maintain these last giant herds still in existence? They were worried that the number of wildlife was so astonishing to them. Did the Serengeti really have enough space, enough food, enough water for all of these animals? Well, really, in a, within a few years, an answer to that question would start to materialize. And it wasn't the answer that the Jimmix either expected or you might think feared, okay? And those answers started to materialize when a young student from Oxford University named Tony Sinclair went as an undergraduate, still in his undergraduate years, to the Serengeti. Now he went with Oxford faculty. Uh, the purpose was primarily to study birds but they quickly drafted him into the aerial survey going on that year. And in the course of that aerial survey, Tony and the others conducting the survey turned up a mystery. And the mystery concerned the number of buffalo. In 1961, several years earlier, they had counted 16,000 buffalo in the Serengeti. But that number had somehow jumped in 1965 to 37,000. Hmm, what's going on with the buffalo? So... Scientists said to Tony, who was now interested that maybe he could do his doctoral work on the Serengeti, would you like to study the buffalo? And he said, sure. He was enchanted with the Serengeti. He thought it would be a great question to pursue. So over the next dozen years or so, first triggered by the buffalo, Tony focused all of his research on the Serengeti. So what he wanted to ask was, 
Why were the buffalo increasing, if indeed they were increasing? And then, really, what explained the great differences in the number of different kinds of animals? Why were there so many of one kind and fewer of another? Why were there so many of any kind? And really, what was in, in Tony's heart was, was to wanting to know, why is the Serengeti the way it is? Because it was such an amazing spectacle of this great diversity of wildlife, these giant herds, the only place like it left on the planet. So he tackled this buffalo mystery, first by continuing the aerial surveys to see how many buffalo were in the Serengeti, and he confirmed that the buffalo population was growing. In fact, it kept growing from 16,000 in 1961, 37,000 in that first save survey he participated in, then into the 50,000s over in the next few years. So the population was, was growing. So that was a mystery. Why, if you might think sort of all of a sudden, were there more let buffalo? Me you, let me show you the logic that Tony Sinclair worked through. He thought, he had to answer a really basic question, which was maybe there were more buffalo because there was more food, right? Wouldn't that give you more buffalo too, if there was just more food? But looking through the Serengeti, he'd been flying over it year after year. It seemed like, you know, the buffalo like these sort of woodland, grassland sort of areas. It seemed like the grass was growing. There seemed to be as, as much food as, as any time before. So he thought, no, that's probably not the answer. Now, he did think maybe there's fewer predators for whichever reason, either a natural cause or maybe because humans were taking them out. But as it turns out, two things that Tony observed. First of all, most buffalo didn't die from predators. Okay? So that wasn't very common that buffalo would be taken down. Most buffalo, when they died, they died of something else. And secondly, counts were going on of predators. And for example, lions are the only things big enough to take down buffalo. And lions were not only fewer, they were actually increasing in this time. So he then thought there was another possibility, and that is the possibility of disease. That another thing that affects wild populations just like us is are diseases that can um, either reduce the ability to, to have babies or obviously cause death. And Tony knew that wildlife got a lot of diseases, buffalo got a lot of diseases, but there was one disease in particular that he was suspicious of. And that was a disease called cattle plague, or the German name Rinderpest. And it was well known in East Africa and well known in the Serengeti because many times in the previous 70 or 80 years, it had swept through the Serengeti. Now here's an important thing to think about. It hit three different kinds of animals. The cattle that were being grazed by humans, you know, by the, especially by the pastoral people, buffalo, and wildebeest, but not other animals. And it was thought that the buffalo and the wildebeest, the wild animals, were the reservoir for the virus, meaning the virus was hiding out in the wild population and that the humans, livestock, human cows, were getting sick from the wildlife. Well, a vaccine became available in the early 1960s and a vaccination program was launched in East Africa. And Tony thought, maybe that vaccination program has had, even though it's just cattle being vaccinated, maybe that's had some spillover benefit to the buffalo. Now, how, would he, how do we check this out? Well, if an animal or you or I are exposed to a virus, our immune systems make something called antibodies that can be measured in our bloodstream. So Tony got blood samples from buffalo, age matched them, to the buffalo populations and said, okay, is something going on with the exposure of buffalo to virus in the Serengeti? And the answer is his first eureka moment. Something really big was going on. That while older buffalo had almost 100% exposure rate to this virus, buffalo born after 1964 showed no exposure to the virus whatsoever. So now he had a good suspect that this virus, which could cause massive mortality, massive death on the Serengeti of Buffalo, was disappearing from the Serengeti. We also learned something else, which was that was because of vaccination of cows. So actually people had it upside down. The virus wasn't in the wildlife. The virus was in the cows. So when you vaccinated the cows, the buffalo didn't get sick. Okay? Now, he knew that the other animal that got sick from this virus was wildebeest. And he started paying attention to the wildebeest. So if the buffalo were booming because this virus had been eradicated, well, then wouldn't the same thing be true of wildebeest, right? If, if the buffalo were benefiting from getting rid of this virus, wouldn't the wildebeest be benefiting? Well, here are the numbers that Tony got for wildebeest over the years. 
That's a lot of wildebeest. He almost couldn't believe it himself. In the 1977 survey, they calculated 1.4 million wildebeest. Okay, huge number over the 1960s. So before we get into the explanation of why that is, just imagine the reaction of the Jimmicks who were worried that maybe the Serengeti didn't have enough food and space for all those animals. There's now a million more, million plus more wildebeest alone in the Serengeti by 1977. There was plenty of capacity in the Serengeti. What was happening was that virus must have been keeping that population down. Now, to confirm his suspicion, he still did the right experiments, which was to get blood samples from those wildebeest of various ages and see about the exposure to rinderpest. He saw the very similar pattern to the buffalo. In fact, no wildebeest born after 1963 had exposure to the virus. So he had his explanation. Why were the buffalo and the wildebeest booming in the Serengeti? It's because a virus had been keeping them down. Now, since he was studying the Serengeti so intensively, as were several other scientists, they were noticing other changes taking place in the Serengeti over this time. So I'm going to give you three observations, and we're going to see whether or not we can kind of connect the dots and figure out what's going on in the Serengeti. So we know we've got more buffalo. We know we've got more wildebeest. Well, one other thing that was noticed was that there was less fire in the Serengeti. If you looked compared to the early 1960s versus the early 1970s, a lot less of the park was burning, and those fires were less intense. So those are percentage of burn areas, and you can see easily cut in half across the park, and more dramatically so in certain regions of the park. So the Serengeti burns every year. It's a natural phenomenon. But the fires were covering less area, and they were, and they were uh, less in intensity. Okay, so less fire. What else was going on? Well, in certain parts of the park, the census revealed there were more giraffes, okay? Twice as many giraffes in 1976 and 1971. Okay, keep that in mind. What else could they see going on in the Serengeti? More trees were growing. We got rid of this virus. That led to more wildebeest. What do wildebeest do? They eat grass. And when they eat that grass, they actually mow it down from about 30 centimeters to about 10 centimeters high. And so that means there's going to be less and shorter grass left over when the Serengeti are done grazing. That grass is the fuel for the fires in the Serengeti. So with less fuel, you're going to have less frequent and less intense fires. Now, what does fire do on the Serengeti? Well, one thing that fire does on the Serengeti is it burns up young trees. So with less fire, there are now more trees. Well, what's the effect of more trees? Well, if you happen to like grazing the tops of acacia trees like giraffes, you've got more food. So this change in the Serengeti, this elimination of this virus, set in motion this whole sequence of events where more wildebeest mowed down the grass, reduced the number of fires. There was now more tree cover, more giraffes for feeding, and a lot more effects because... For example, that greater tree cover means there's more places for birds to nest. There's actually also more cover for the predators. So these changes have many effects on other kinds of creatures. So what Tony became to appreciate is that, and this may be contrary to what you've seen on TV. I sort of imagine if you see a, if you see a film about the African savanna, within the first two minutes, you're going to see a cat chasing a gazelle or a zebra. Am I right? Okay. Is that what makes the Serengeti the way it is? No. What Tony Sinclair would say, what makes the Serengeti the way it is, is a million lawnmowers. <laughs> it's one million wildebeest just chewing grass, and they move in a 600-mile circuit around the Serengeti in the course of a year. And by chewing that grass down, they have changed the habitat for so many other creatures. Shorter grass not only means there's less fire, but that shorter grass creates better habitat, as it turns out, for butterflies. The more trees, as I told you, needs, is better for the bird life. Greater diversity of birds. More cover for predators. It's the, Seren it's the wildebeest mowing the Serengeti that make the Serengeti the way it is. And a little later, we'll ask you whether you think they should put a paved highway through the migration route. So scientists, ecologists have a term for an animal that has such an important influence on the whole community to which it belongs. And that's my first Serengeti rule of the night. I'm going to give you four. Um, and the first rule borrows a little bit from, from George Orwell. But for a long time, biologists sort of looked at a 
at a community and sort of thought that, well, everybody was a component and, and sort of everything was equal. Well, some animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others, okay? And we call these keystone species. Keystone species, they regulate community diversity. They have a disproportionate effect on the diversity of creatures that live in a given place. The name comes from, not from the Serengeti. This was discovered somewhere else, not by Tony Sinclair. In fact, in a really different system, it was discovered by Bob Payne, an ecologist working off the coast of Washington in the USA, looking at starfish and the communities they belong to. And what Bob Payne found was that the starfish were keystones in that community. The idea he came up with in this little kind of manic diagram on the right is that if this species were removed, and he did the experiment of removing starfish, the whole community collapsed, just like if you remove the, the keystone from a Roman arch, the arch collapses. So he said, so some species are much more important than others at holding together a community, at the diversity of the community. And he even did the experiments of removing other things in the community and showing that they didn't have any major effect. So wildebeest are keystone species. And Bob Payne, the same ecologist, again, working off in tide pools on the Pacific Ocean, coined another word to describe the phenomenon I, des I described for you where one species has this sort of chain reaction effect through the whole ecosystem. Now, if you think about food chains, we, we describe a lot of the, the way the world works in, is, a, is a series of, of food chains where plants provide the food for animals that graze on plants, and then those animals provide the food for predators like lions and things like this. And that when we describe each level of the food chain, we call it a trophic level. And what Bob Payne described this sort of chain reaction as a trophic cascade a series of indirect effects rippling out from one particular species having a big impact on the rest of the community. And that quickly gets us to our Serengeti rule number two, so you're almost halfway home, all right? And that is that some species have really strong indirect effects on other species through trophic cascades. This was incredibly surprising to scientists, that wildebeest would affect the number of giraffes, right? Who would suspect such a thing? And there's some other examples I'll give you before I finish tonight. Okay, so we've learned a little bit about what makes the Serengeti the way it is, but you might be wondering, what about, what controls the wildebeest? Did they just keep right on growing without that virus around? Well, the answer is no. If they kept right on growing, then basically East Africa would be a carpet of wildebeest, and they'd probably be spilling out into the ocean. Um, so wildebeest are regulated too. And what actually happened was that 1977, that 1 1.4 million wildebeest was the peak year for wildebeest. They leveled off at about a million, a lower number, okay? And here's a curve. So what's plotted on the left is how many wildebeest there are in, in different years. And you'll notice a really steep growth of the wildebeest, as I'm telling you about, up through about 1977. And then they kind of declined a bit, kind of overshot the mark, really. The wildebeest could be regulated by the amount of food that's around, or they could be regulated by who's eating them, right? And we call that bottom-up from food or top-down from predators regulation. So think of a food chain like a pyramid. Here, the wildebeest are in the middle of the pyramid. They're eating plants. They're eating grass. But they are, to some degree, taken by predators. So what controls the number of wildebeest? Are they kept in check by predators, or are they limited by food? And before I tell you the answer to the wildebeest, I thought it'd be interesting for you to know in general what's going on in the Serengeti with other animals, because I think it will help you as it helped me understand the Serengeti as I looked at it. So you've got this possibility of top-down and bottom-up regulation. So which Serengeti mammal, mammals are regulated in which way? Think of those storybook creatures that live on the Serengeti. What do we know about how they're regulated? Well, what we know comes from work by Tony Sinclair, uh, Simon Mduma, uh, Justin Brashears and, and collaborators over a long period of time of observing what Serengeti animals die from, okay? So here's a graph. You know, you might be thinking, oh, okay, but just study it because it's one of the most informative little graphs I, I, I've enjoyed in a long time. So on the left, they're mapping the percent of animals that die from predation as a cause of mortality. And on the right, the body size of the animals. And look at the relationship. These are the smaller Serengeti mammals, the Oribe being the smallest. Uh, look at that death rate from predation, 100%. Okay, I, I sometimes imagine, you know, what does an Oribe parent tell their young Oribe? 
about their future. Okay, kind of, kind of fill that in. All right, but look at the other end of the spectrum here. Elephants, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, generally giraffes, essentially zero predation. It happens, but it's so occasional it makes no dent in the population. And look at the relationship to body size. These big animals are so big, they've escaped the power of predators. So now for everyone, I think you probably, you may have to be under 50 to sort of get this comparison, but I would describe this. This is the James Dean live fast, die young lifestyle, okay? And this is the more Marlon Brando, eat all you can kind of lifestyle <laughs> out here on the right. And, and what's going on here is that, of course, these animals, yes, they suffer a lot of predation, but generally they do reproduce rapidly, okay? So they're keeping their numbers up by reproducing rapidly. They're small body size, so they have lower requirements for food, and they can reproduce more rapidly. These animals, really large, they reproduce slowly. It takes a long time to get to sexual maturity. Gestation time, as you know, in the elephants, the longest of, of any land mammal. So this is a different lifestyle. It says, okay, I'm going to escape predation, but I'm really dependent upon food supply. I need massive amounts of food every day, okay? And there are some animals sort of in the middle. So where does the wildebeest land? And careful observation shows that, in fact, the wildebeest are regulated by food. It's the food supply that has the greatest effect. Yes, some die from predation, but that's not the major effect. The major effect has to do with the amount of food that's around. And how does that work? Regulation is occur occurs according to density. In other words, the number of animals per, per in, in a given area. So when there's a small number of animals, they can grow at a fast rate. When there's a large number of animals, they either slow down, stop, or decline. Okay? And this is our third Serengeti rule. Many animals show this food-regulated pattern, this density-regulated pattern. Okay? So the regulation of a good number of species depends upon their density, if you're food-regulated. And that's true of buffalo which don't generally die of much of predation. It's true of elephants, okay? They're limited by their density, by the amount of food that's available in this sort of way. In fact, elephants, in a, if, if there's a, a bad season, a dry season, there's not a lot of food, there's even a, a feedback in the elephants hormonally that suppresses reproduction so that they don't have babies born in, under bad conditions, okay? All right. So why have I told you this all about the Serengeti? All of these rules... Keystone species, trophic cascades, density regulation, all of these rules were discovered somewhere else first. I just thought it would be most enlightening, easiest to grasp if I told you in terms of what's going on in the Serengeti in terms of these storybook animals. But I've also told you these rules and dubbed them sort of the Serengeti rules because really almost every habitat in the world is a Serengeti. From the tiniest little plant to the greatest forest to the deep ocean, okay? And because every place is a Serengeti with predators, with things that eat plants, with, thing, with the plants themselves, then these rules matter in each place. And if we're going to intervene in ecosystems, intervene in places, we really need to know the rules of regulation, just as we need to know the rules of regulation in the human body. We need to know the key players in any community, those species that regulate community structure. We need to understand the rules that govern their play. Who eats whom? Are there trophic cascades operating? And then if there's a problem, we need to figure out what it might take to either replace what is missing or fix broken links in that ecosystem. So let me, in the last part of my talk, illustrate for you um, in, a, in a, about three examples, sort of putting these rules into practice. So I told you even a tiny blade of rice could be a Serengeti. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. So here's a, a rice plant with a little insect called a plant hopper on it. These plant hoppers feed on these rice plants. Now, you can imagine if you're a rice farmer and your livelihood or your family's food security depends upon having rice plants, this presence of this bug might concern you. And over the years, you know, the habit might have developed that if you see these bugs, you might want to hit them with pesticide. But in the early to mid-1970s, some farmers, particularly in Indonesia, noticed a strange phenomenon when they hit their fields with pesticide. The plant hoppers could go up 800-fold. That's not a good thing, okay? They devastate the rice plants. They cause this phenomenon um, called hopper burn. So you see a lot more plant hoppers in the rice, and you see this sort of brownout in the field where the, essentially the plants have been sucked dry by the plant hoppers. Now, how could this happen? You give a pesticide and the number of bugs goes up. Now you'd think, 
if the bugs were resistant to the pesticide, they would just shrug it off. And in fact, that's what happened. The bugs evolved resistance to the pesticide, so it didn't affect them. But why would the numbers go up? Well, it turns out spiders prey on plant hoppers, and a few other things do as well. And what happens is the pesticide kills the spiders, which are not resistant. And without those spiders, the plant hoppers go crazy. And if you change your habits and don't spray the moment you see some plant hoppers, it turns out the fields do much better. So the practice of pest management has changed completely in these rice fields, away from bombarding with pesticides and more towards trying to have natural enemies around. And that means planting your fields differently, planting some other plants around that give a hideout for things like spiders, or planting some of those plants amongst your you're right, so that there's some population of spiders and other things around to control the plant hoppers. So here's an example, a little miniature Serengeti where the predator was missing because of something we were doing. And the absence of that predator was causing problems. I'll give you another example on a lot bigger scale. So I said every place is a Serengeti. Let's go back to a place I've been a number of times, Yellowstone National Park in the American West. Um, the sort of iconic plant in uh, the American West is the aspen tree. Here it is in the fall, showing its fall colors. But biologists started to notice there was something really strange about the aspen in Yellowstone. And what was strange was that, this is in the mid-1990s or so, they're all pretty much very old. If you looked at, at how old the different aspen were, it turns out that sort of younger aspen were just plain missing from the park. They were pretty scarce. So that meant that most of the aspen were pretty old. That meant that they were more vulnerable to disease, more vulnerable to being blown over in storms and things like this. So Yellowstone was losing its aspen, as were other parts of the American West. Now, why might this be happening? Well, I'll give you a picture that might be a hint. Okay? So here's a biologist, Bob Ripple, who worked on this, standing um, in a field in front of some aspen. And you can see that that bark is chewed up to perhaps 10 feet or more high on all of those trees. And the only creature that can chew that high on bark is elk. So the suspected culprit of what was causing the aspen problem was that the elk were really chewing down the aspen. Well, if the elk are grazing on these plants and being allowed to do that freely, maybe that's the problem. And the suspicion was that something was missing. And what was missing from Yellowstone? Well, we got to go to historical records. The wolves were exterminated from Yellowstone in the 1920s, something that happened across most of North America. So maybe the problem was, just like on those rice plants, we were missing the big predator in Yellowstone that controlled the number of elk. Well, if that was right, I wonder what would happen if you put wolves back into Yellowstone. Now, there's a pretty big experiment. It took 20 years of debate before it happened, but it happened in 1995. Here's the first wolf coming back into Yellowstone, imported from Canada. Okay, so what happened? Well, the wolves, a good number of wolves were introduced, and they sort of established themselves and sort of bounced around a number in Yellowstone, but there's been a pretty steady pattern of decrease in the elk in Yellowstone. Okay, reduced by more than half. Okay, so maybe that would be a a good prediction. More, if you got wolves in there, a predator in there, they're going to they're going to eat their favorite food and they're going to eat elk. Okay, what happened? What else happened in the park? Well, let's look at what happened to browsing on aspen. Drops dramatically. What happens to aspen height? Increases dramatically. So yeah, this is what's happening. You put a predator in, and the trees are now growing. Okay, that's the insight of a trophic cascade. That's what still shocks people that a presence of a predator influences what plants grow in a place. And not just, as it turns out, aspen. As people looked around the park, look at willow. So this is a picture taken from the same vantage point in Yellowstone before the wolves were reintroduced and now after. This is all willow growing in the foreground. And willow is not only a favorite food for things like beavers, it's what they make their dams out of. So when beavers see this will these willows, they start making more beaver dams, and there's a lot more beaver colonies in Yellowstone now than were there before wolves were introduced. So who would think that if you put more wolves, put wolves back into Yellowstone, you'd have more beavers? Crazy, right? So willows rebound, and cottonwood rebound along the stream beds. So reintroducing wolves has had a dramatic effect on the trees and vegetation in Yellowstone, and then with things, beavers building dams, with willows there, bird life is changing. 
The coyote patterns are changing. All sorts of other animals are changing due to the presence of this keystone predator, the wolves. Okay. Now, the other thing that I'd like you to take home tonight, partly shown by this Yellowstone story, is nature rebounding. This was measurable on a scale of a decade or less. We're now two decades into the experiment. But it's not the only time we've seen a dramatic effect. And the effect that's really stunning, and it's the last Serengeti rule of the night, is that nature is incredibly resilient. And what I mean by that is that given a chance, that might mean provided a proper habitat, some protection from us, time, populations can rebound dramatically. Yellowstone, it took a lot of work to put just a small number of wolves into Yellowstone. That's, mon that's manipulating single species. What happens when a system is in really bad shape? And you're not just missing one predator or one species. And I want to finish tonight by telling you about a really important story going on in the world. And it involves a park in central Mozambique, in southern, southeastern Africa, called Gorongosa National Park. Now, Gorongosa in the 1960s was uh, a, a tourist destination, especially for sort of the jet setters, kind of the Hollywood types, because it had a massive concentration of lion and elephants and buffalo and hippos, the things that tourists like to see, kind of concentrated, especially along this lake that's right in the center of the park. The little map I'm showing you here on the right is showing you this lake is sort of the central feature of the park. And here comes the, the terrible side of the story. After, uh, after Mozambique's independence from Portugal, a civil war broke out in Mozambique, lasted almost two decades, um, killed a million people, displaced five million more, and unfortunately, Gorongosa was about the geographic center of that civil war. And um, in addition to being shot for food, a lot of the wildlife was shot, for example, poached and sold for, for body parts like um, ivory and things like that, and all of the buildings in the park were destroyed. Before the war, in 1972, there were 14,000 buffalo were counted in Gorongosa. That was reduced to fewer than 50 at the end of the war. Elephant, again, from 2,500 down to perhaps 100. Hippo from 3,000 or so down to 50. You can see the same sort of pattern in all sorts of animals. Lion completely disappeared. Pretty bad story, pretty bad situation. Until the early 2000s, when an American philanthropist named Greg Carr learned about Mozambique, learned about Gorongosa, and thought, you know, every other country in Southern Africa has a tourist industry, but Mozambique has, has lost theirs. That could be an important economic development engine for Mozambique to, to make its way back after three decades of, of horror. And so Greg Carr signed a joint management agreement with the Mozambique government to help to try to restore Gorongosa National Park, starting in 2004. He committed his own personal funds, he invited in scientists from around the world, and he really started from scratch, building the first building, you know, restoring buildings and um, reestablishing the park. So what's going on with wildlife in Gorongosa? 11 years into the restoration project. Okay. In 2000, when you added up all the animals I talked about, elephants, hippos, antelope, buffalo, et cetera, there were fewer than 1,000 animals combined. Fewer than 1,000 large animals combined. Today, 71,000. Nature is resilient. Greg Carr imported maybe about 300 animals, a couple hundred buffalo, some zebra, some elephants, some hippos. This is largely the rebound of animals that were already there and animals that once the fighting disappeared, migrated in from other parts of Mozambique. In fact, this is working so well in Gorongosa that the vision has changed. It, the question 10 years ago was, is it possible for Gorongosa to come back at all? And Greg Carr was told he was wasting his time and his money. Gorongosa was dead. Well, that was wrong. Now the vision has changed to, hmm, maybe this will work elsewhere in the country. Maybe we can make an even bigger reserve for these animals. And so the future of Gorongosa is actually to get a lot bigger. Uh, it's a plan that's unfolding right now to expand the whole area about eightfold. So this is the boundaries of the park, but the um, 
future plan is to expand the, the conservation area all the way to the Zambezi River and to the Indian Ocean, picking up some already existing reserves and some hunting concessions. There'll be people living here just as they live in the Serengeti conservation area. But forestry will be controlled, farming will be controlled and monitored to be done in a way where humans and animals can share the land. That eightfold expansion, by the way, would make Gorongosa essentially the same size as the Serengeti, which includes parts of Kenya, parts of northern Tanzania, and North, the Ngorogoro Crater, a vast area. Okay? This is not the direction that most parks are going in the world, expanding back out from what they used to be. And they think that an expanded Gorongosa could carry about 10,000 elephants and about 500 lions. So, guess is this is perhaps going to take the next 25 or 30 years, and if you ask Greg Carr, he'd say that is exactly how he's going to spend the rest of his life. He's on the ground in Gorongosa about six months out of the year, uh, directing the, and managing the project. So, the future of Gorongosa looks a lot more promising. What about the Serengeti itself? Well, I am uh, happy to report that the only roads through the Serengeti Remain unpaved, and let's, let's keep them that way. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That was, you are a fabulous storyteller. It was really, really absolutely wonderful. And I know there are lots of questions out in the audience, but I'll ask a couple which I've been dying to ask you. Um, you talked about the resilience of nature. Some people are very concerned about how resilient nature will be globally in the face of climate change and global warming. What, what's your assessment of that, having done your work on this book and other research? Yeah, so let, let me explain a little background. So in, in the book, um, and in many of the ecologists that I interviewed, so really the book is, are the stories of, of many pioneering people who work this out. I, I don't work in this area. I work indoors. I, I try to go there <laughs> on vacation, okay? Um, that there's a sense in the community that global warming is important. We're going to get to it in a second. But that the other challenges of over-harvesting areas, of degrading ecosystems, of, for example, the removal of predators. Predators have been selectively removed by humans now for centuries. We don't like wolves, we don't like lions, we don't like bears, and sharks are taking a beating in the oceans. So, you know, we, there are other important things to talk about what's going on environmentally in the world, particularly as it, in, in terms of those systems that sustain us, fisheries, croplands, etc. Now, if you take those forces and now add to them climate change, that's going to stress some of these systems um, even more. Now, in the case, uh, and it's probably going to have a, well, it's definitely going to have a different effect between land and water. So one thing to think about is that the way humans have carved up the use of the land, you just look at the map of Gorongosa or the map of Serengeti, there's boundaries with, you know, big human settlements. So to the degree that Serengeti or Gorongosa get warmer, or drier um, in the coming decades, coming years, the animals have nowhere to go, right? They're boxed in. So one of the great challenges is that what would normally happen in the normal cycles of the earth changing is that animals would move to where <coughs> the habitat's better, where the, veget the, veg the plant life is going to change, and the animals would move. But we've boxed them in. So that is a really worrisome thing. And people are thinking about how can we create corridors that give animals more mobility um, on land. In the oceans, different things are happening. As you know, the, there's a great concern about the oceans becoming more acidic and what that's going to do to shelly creatures, shellfish that we eat, corals, etc. Um, so you're no doubt, because of the rapid change, you're no doubt stressing all of these systems. You're stressing the ability of individual species to adapt to those new conditions. And of course, as different species manage better or worse, you're going to change the interactions that take place. And really what I hope, one of the things you're taking home from the talk tonight is how much the world is built on interactions. And that when we change those interactions, you know, what comes out, what, what eventually comes out from that is, is perhaps not what we like and may not be a situation that will you know, make the world as productive as it has been for, for past decades. You know, the, many people, commentators, scientists as well, would say, you know, if, if you know, the, the Earth is eventually in the long run going to be okay. 
But what's on the earth is, is going to change. And in the short term, you know, our concern is that there's 7.4 billion of us right now, and we're dependent on the earth to feed us, to give us water, right? To give us air, oxygen. And these are things that we have to be really concerned about. Are our lakes going to be as productive? Are the coastal oceans going to be as productive? What's going to happen to cropland? Um, you know, it, it, just out of self-interest, is the world going to be able to support us when it's under greater stress? So we have to think about the things that we can control, particularly on a more local and regional level, um, how we manage our land, how we manage our, our waterways. And then, of course, in the longer run, we have to do something collectively about the warming of the globe. But I, I will tell you just a confession. I, the words climate change and global warming are not in this book. And it's, part, it's not, uh, don't worry, I'm not a denialist. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's partly to make sure that the attention was on other things that not only do we need to pay attention to, but I think are under a more local control, that there are things that we can do to make our local woods, ponds, lakes more productive. And I think one of the problems, of course, of, of the climate change problem is that people feel powerless against um, you know, the massive global uh, energy, you know, fossil fuel-based economy. So uh, there are things that we can do to make our environment healthier. Okay, now it's your chance. We've got a couple of microphones, so please wait till you've got one. Um, I probably won't be able to get around to everyone, so apologies in advance for those whom I don't. Uh, yeah, does every ecosystem have a keystone species? Not necessarily, and I think, um, yeah, so I don't want to make you think that when I say every place is a Serengeti, it generally, if there's a food chain operating, it's going to have greenery, plants that have, have some type, aquatic or terrestrial, that are harvesting sunlight, making food, something that eats those plants, and then something that might eat the things that eat the plants. Uh, but not necessarily a keystone and not necessarily a trophic cascade working in that way. And um, I don't know any theory of why there would or would not be keystones. A couple of kind of keystones that we didn't talk about um, that are certainly in the news today, how about bees? Okay, have an enormous influence on, on diversity. Not a predator, but a really different sort of role in those ecosystems. In the Himalaya, um, uh, pika, little animals um, that have a big effect on uh, the way water runs off the mountain, on burrows formed by other animals, etc. So another important class of keystones are what we call ecosystem engineers. They kind of, like the wildebeest, they're sort of engineering the habitat for other creatures. But no, I, not every place has a keystone like that, where there's, you know, one species playing a really disproportionate role. Um, yeah, we're talking about generally very sparsely populated parts of the world, and in the case studies you gave in Africa, not, the population doesn't have the wherewithal uh, on all levels, from educational to financial, to exert a lot of influence. How ideological is what you're suggesting? If we were to do the same thing in Europe, heavily populated parts of Europe, how would that work? Well, I don't know about Europe. Uh, I think some more predators in New Jersey would help America a lot. But, um, <laughs> Uh, so first, I, I, I thought you were headed one way, one way and, you, and you headed back another way. So let me just go to, to Africa. There's 250,000 people living in the immediate zone around Gorongosa National Park. And I just want to make sure I credit uh, Greg Carr with the vision that he spent as much money outside the park as in on schools, clinics, community centers, farming programs, etc., because you conservation these days is an integrated process. You just, I, I know I've talked about animals tonight, but if you don't take into consideration the people, you're, you're going to fail. So there's a quarter million people living around Gorongosa, and that number's only going to go up. So you have to take the people into account, and you know, whether that's, uh, and there's important diseases in, in, Gorong, in around Gorongosa, malaria, HIV, um, and so there's a lot being done on the ground to improve the, the quality and quantity of life for, for Mozambicans. And you mentioned education for a second about wherewithal. This is, I'm, I'm just going to do a little, I'm going to do a little bragging. I'm, I'm, I was just a visitor, but I, uh, my other job is I um, run science education for a large philanthropy in the United States. And seeing what was going on in Gorongosa, seeing the science education needs given a couple decade gap where no teachers were trained in Mozambique, you know, students didn't have the opportunity to go to school. You know, they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. Um, that my organization, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, has invested um, 
considerably to uh, develop science education programs on the ground in, in Gorongosa targeted exclusively to Mozambican students. So you have to look in the really, you have to have a really long-term view of what's it going to be necessary, what's going to be required to rebuild science capacity, um, consider the economic development aspects, consider the human development aspects, and hopefully if those things are going okay, the wildlife have a shot. Now the park is really important because it's a major source of water for all the surrounding community. And if you deforest the mountain, there's a mountain in the middle of Gorongosa, Gorongosa Mountain, um, you've got problems. So people also need ecological education to understand um, what it's going to take that, that, that their lives and farms are going to be okay. So now you asked about putting things in heavily populated parts of, of Europe. Well, I, I don't think, I mean, you know, Wyoming was a safe place to put a fair number of wolves, okay? There's some, there's some, some open area. These issues are always going to be looked at. That's why it took 20 years in America. There, the, I can't remember, I think it's in the book, the number of public, I think 200,000 public comments registered about putting wolves back into Yellowstone. It was a major political battle. Um, so I assume that depending upon what the creatures are, uh, there will be a battle. There's now a question. There's no grizzly bears left in California. And people are now asking, should we put the grizzlies back in California? Well, that's a pretty populated state. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty interesting experiment. But um, I think it's going to happen. Just it's not going to happen where there's a lot of people. The um, elephants, because they're, they're led by a matriarch who knows where all the water is. So season after season, if there's droughts, only she can save that herd. Is there any special ways of looking after that specific problem? Because all the other animals are just kind of look after themselves, don't they? They live by the water, that's where it is. But if they've got to go all across. Yeah, I mean, if path. you take a place like Gorongosa, there's, I mean, it's, it's um, I, I, there may be people here again who know better. Looking after wild elephants is an interesting proposition. Um, uh, I look in an elephant's eye and I see, get out of my way. Um, so, there's no active effort. For, for example, there's actually a, a fairly bad drought in, in southern Africa. I just heard in the last week or 10 days massive rains in, in Gorongosa, so I'm glad to hear that. But there's no human intervention operating there now. I did hear, it was quite controversial, somewhere out of southern Africa, somebody shipped 16 elephants to a Texas zoo, you know, which is one way to do something. Uh, you know, but I, I don't think zoos are the answer there. I think, you know, you, I'm, I, we're, I'm really interested in, I mean, I, I, I understand the role of zoos, but I just think we're talking about, about natural habitat. So, yes, you could try to find ways to look after elephants, but I, my sense in practice is that, you know, I'm sure if you came by with a water truck and the water hole was going dry and you put a lot of water there, the elephants would exploit it. But there's, you know, they're not going to take a lot of, a lot more direction than that from, from humans, um, to my knowledge. Well, the biggest thing you can do is protect them from the poachers. That's right. By far the most important That's right. thing. A, a, a little, a little sub-story out of Gorongosa. About 60% of the elephants in Gorongosa are tuskless. Hmm. So uh, elephants without tusks uh, occur at a certain frequency. It's a, it's a genetically inherited trait. And what happened was those elephants were not shot by poachers in previous decades. And so now as the population rebounds, you have these tuskless elephants. And some think good for the elephants because it means they're worthless to poachers. But of course, tusks are there for some reason. They've been around a long time. I think the elephants are probably missing that, um, that tool. But uh, nonetheless, 60% of the elephants are tuskless. Just a quick question on the numbers that you've shown on the growth of the um, buffaloes and wildebeest, which we saw the wildebeest grew so much more, you know, many, many, many times, two millions. And actually in the park in Mozambique, the numbers of buffaloes and um, wildebeest were pretty much the same on the graphs that you've shown. Why the wildebeest, they, you know, increased so much more dramatically than buffalo, for example, in the same time? Great question. Mm -hmm. Why the wildebeest? Why the wildebeest so numbers? It's actually Serengeti rule number five, but I was going to spare you that one. <laughs> Migration. Mm. So what happens is, is if you're food limited, okay, um, move to fresh sources of food. The wildebeest migrate. That allows them to access food throughout the year. Buffalo are largely resident. Second of all, well, actually, two more things. <laughs> yeah, you get a biologist going. It's just like <laughs> winding up a little toy. Um, second of all, the wildebeest, so some wildebeest are taken by predators. About, I think it's about 13% predation. But the lions den their cubs, so they're not on the go. So the lions don't follow the wildebeest herds. They have to stay put to raise their young. 
So by migration, they're getting away from their predators. They're not essentially sitting ducks. Thirdly, the wildebeest have synchronized birth. So there's this massive spectacle in a short interval of time, I think late January or early February, it goes off a lunar cycle where 200, 250,000 wildebeest are born, just overwhelming predator appetites. And those wildebeest are able to stand very quickly and, and you know, be you know, reasonably mobile in a short time. And so, so we think there's a few strategies going on in wildebeest that allow them to reduce predation and increase their numbers and their density. But if you look across the world at other things that migrate, they achieve a higher density than similar populations that stay put. So that's why more wildebeest and more wildebeest than buffalo. And there's no migration going on in Gorongosa. They're kind of boxed in in this valley. So there's wildebeest and buffalo there, but the wildebeest are not that numerous. Yes. I think you're going to ask the last question. I apologize to those we haven't got to, but I was strictly told to finish by half past. Yes, sir. Okay, um, thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, I hate to mention them, but humans, um, we're, we seem to be the only exception to these rules, really, because like, <laughs> we haven't really regulated our, our population, really. We've just kept on expanding and expanding and expanding. I don't know whether yeah, you that's could've, You could have written the last few lines of this book. That's a <laughs> great it's a, last it's, question. It's a, it's a great point. Yeah, so this, so this is, I think, you know, realizing... You know, regulation is an inescapable fact of nature. Regulation is going to be an inescapable fact for those of us that depend on her, right? So we're at 7.4 billion people. We need what nature produces. Um, as our numbers have gone up, um, the tax we're putting on nature, the amount of, of her production that we are taking for ourselves is really large. And I don't want to, I, I know it can sound sort of scoldy and anti-human or whatever, that sort of thing. That's just sort of the reality is that you know, if, if we're, if I, maybe I should make a slide that plots the number of humans sort of right along the number of wildebeest. Mm -hmm. You know, we've gone through that boom in the last century, you know, almost fourfold more humans. So that's a lot of needs um, to be met. And, you know, we don't have predators, <laughs> okay, except each other. Okay, I had to say some <laughs> kind of wise remark. Um, and uh, we, we, of course, do have disease, but we're all, we're, you know, longevity, life expectancy has gone way up in the 20th century. So, you know, we have a culture that beats back disease, that feeds the hungry, um, et cetera. So uh, our challenge, actually looking at you, your challenge, I'm gray-bearded, uh, your challenge is to figure out what we're going to do with this planet with 7.4 billion people and, and growing. And, you know, I, I think the answer is we're just going to have to do a better job of, of regulating how we harvest resources, make our lands and waters more productive, and make sure that we try to learn as much as we can about how those places work so that there's enough for all of us. Thank you very much. And on that note, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. In our next episode, four experts debate the scientific and societal implications of race and racism.